Mid and late 1990s, when the Taliban had first uh, effectively seized control of Afghanistan, it would pop up in the news on, on occasion, almost as an oddity really, but the only constituencies in the West, certainly in the U.S., who were really genuinely aggrieved over what was happening in Afghanistan under the Taliban, who really wanted Western action, were women's rights advocates and religious freedom advocates, um, who were aware of you know, the, the barbarism being visited on, on women in Afghanistan, uh, certainly of the manifest religious freedom violations the Taliban being almost defined by uh, religious persecution, whether it was the symbolic things like destroying those ancient Buddhist statues there or uh, persecution of any Afghan Muslims who would leave Islam and convert to another faith and tolerance towards any Christian missionaries who were there, but especially the ones who suffered the most were uh, the majority of Afghan Muslims who did not uh, subscribe to the, the Taliban's really extremist interpretation. So it's really just the religious freedom advocates and the women's rights advocates in the West who are, who are paying attention to this and calling, calling for action. And the, the rest of the foreign policy community more broadly would kind of wring its hands and say, well, yes, it really is unfortunate what's going on there, but what what are our equities in Afghanistan? Um, it's just a humanitarian situation uh, in crisis, not, nothing else. But of course, with the September 11th attacks, all of that changes, and all of a sudden we realize that the conditions within a country can have very direct uh, applications and implications for for those of us living living outside the country. And it's it's no accident, I think, that the same uh, re conditions of religious persecution, which were so appalling and anathema to religious freedom advocates, were actually appealing to uh, Al-Qaeda and Tim Bin Laden. That was no coincidence that he wanted to, to set, up, set up camp there uh, alongside his, his co-belligerents with, with, the, with the Taliban. Um, again, let me be clear, this is not saying that the West's indifference to what was going on in Afghanistan in the 90s makes the West culpable or to blame for the 9-11 attacks, but I think it was a missed opportunity really to, to connect the dots. And that's where as a more general principle, I think that severe violations of religious freedom where they're occurring can sometimes serve as a diagnostic or an early warning indicator of a potential security threat. Um, there's not always going to be that exact correlation, but uh, it, it's going to be there more, more often than not. And I think uh, national security analysts uh, need, to, need to take that more, more seriously, and policymakers do, do as well. It's because uh, religion-based terrorism shares some common attributes with religious persecution. Both define themselves by intolerance of persons of different religious identities. Both seek to employ coercive, often violent measures to advance their goals. Both claim a monopoly on truth that denies any rights of dissent. Uh, both regard religious, religious dissent in particular as actually a first, not just a nuisance, but a first order threat to, to, to their goals. Uh, I see uh, Paul Marshall out there in the audience, and Paul has written books on this subject, and I commend, commend those to you as well. He's done some very, uh, very, I think, uh, very good thinking on the connections between religious extremism and ideologies and their, uh, the, the broader maladies that can, that can result. But likewise, the good news in, in this, if there is some good news, is that the, often the most effective voices against religion-based terrorism, particularly in the Islamic con uh, context, violent, violent jihadism, uh, often the most effective voices against that are going to be other religious persons themselves who advance a peaceful and tolerant in interpretation of their faith. Um, and so winning the war of ideas in, uh, in the broader, broader, broader struggle here, uh, or even making progress in the war of ideas, uh, will depend on protecting and empowering those religious voices who contend for peaceful interpretations of, of, of their faith and who refute versions that, that support, support terrorism. And for, for those outside that faith community, again, in this case, the, uh, the war of ideas within Islam, uh, this doesn't mean that all of us would be just innocent, uh, just uh, disinterested bystanders, if you will, uh, but rather our, uh, the, one of the most strategic contributions we can make is trying to promote religious freedom as a, a way of supporting a pluralism of voices, particularly those peaceful and more tolerant voices who want to contend for uh, more space for that interpretation of their, of their faith. Uh, because promoting religious freedom doesn't just provide a platform for those voices, but it also helps to ameliorate the enabling environment, if you will, uh, of religious intolerance in which extremist ideologies often, often thrive. Again, uh, I would say it's no coincidence that the majority of the September 11th hijackers actually were from Saudi Arabia, where they grew up and were raised on a diet of extreme religious intolerance there, which served, I think, as, as an enabling environment. And, and in, you know, post, uh, after the attacks, caused some real challenges for the Saudi government as well as for uh, one of their close allies, the, the American government. 
So there's, I think as a general principle, we can say there's a notable correlation between religious freedom and security. One would be hard pressed to find a nation that respects religious freedom and also poses a security threat to, to the United States.